Well, it's a great privilege for us to have Lord Egremont here this evening and to hear him talk about Siegfried Sassoon and sign copies of his new biography. Max Egremont studied modern history at Oxford, and as you know, he lives at uh, Petworth, one of the great houses in England, and he has spent a great deal of his career as a writer. He is the author of four novels, Ladies' Man, Painted Lives, Secret Lives, and Second Spring. But we know him better, I think, here in the United States as a distinguished biographer of Balfour, A Life of Arthur James Balfour. More recently, Under Two Flags, The Life of Major General Sir Edward Spears. And most recently, of course, Siegfried Sassoon, A Life. So please join me in warming wel uh, uh, warmly welcoming Max Egremont to the Boston Athenaeum. Thank you. On January the 28th, 1920, Siegfried Sassoon came to New York. He was that, that familiar figure the Briton about to embark on an, an American lecture tour, a successor of Oscar Wilde and Charles Dickens, predecessor of many others, including me. <laughs> He'd come to New York as travelers did in those days, by boat. He'd come alone. He was in a first-class cabin. And the solitude came as quite a relief to him. For Sassoon had left an England still full of demanding interest in him. Siegfried Sassoon, in his 34th year, was a Byronic figure, a hero, and a poet. But why should anyone on this side of the Atlantic have been interested in Siegfried Sassoon? Surely he was too English. Someone who, before going to France to fight in November 1915, had never left England. Someone whose lyrical verses often show nostalgia for those ordered, gentle landscapes unseen by most Americans. And the war itself that had made Sassoon's reputation as a poet, hadn't that been a war to which Americans had come late and against many of their instincts to go to Europe to fight in a war of kings and emperors. Wasn't this a denial of why so many Americans had left Europe to escape these dynasties that had oppressed their forebears? America entered the war in 1917 and became a vital, perhaps the most vital part of the Allied victory a year later. But for the United States, it hadn't been the cataclysmic struggle experienced by the European countries. The casualty figures tell the story. 116,000 for the United States as against 942,000 for the British Empire, 1.2 million for Austria-Hungary, 1.3 million for France, 1.7 million um, for the Russians, 1.9 million for Germany. And as I said, many Americans had seen this as a tragic waste of life. All for a European civilization that was, to quote the American poet Ezra Pound, an old bitch gone in the teeth. <laughs> but Siegfried Sassoon's reputation gave him an exceptional interest, I think. He was that universal figure, both hero and he was a victim. He'd opposed the war, and yet he'd fought bravely in it and had suffered a form of imprisonment for his beliefs. He'd also written some of the most powerful war poetry of all time, poetry which is still read today by soldiers serving in Iraq. So Sassoon is a writer 
of conflict. This is how most people, at least in Britain, see him today. When we hear his name, we think of a shy, rather modest young man in uniform, an officer, someone of sensibility and courage, the soldier poet. We think of him against that familiar First War lunar landscape of craters and a bare, treeless earth, the world of dawn attacks, uh, dawn attacks across no man's land, of badly planned, bloody offensives against an impregnable enemy, of bodies impaled upon barbed wire, of mud-clogged trenches, then of a brave protest against such folly. All good writers make their worlds, and this is Siegfried Sassoon's. He moves in it, I think, very much as an Englishman of a certain type, generally implying he's a bit of an amateur. Even that familiar English figure, the clumsy clot, not much good at what he does, before giving a glimpse of some incident or conversation to show that actually he's really very good at what he does, a good writer, a good officer, a good poet, and a good man. So here, I think, is the first of Sassoon's conflicts, that between the way he shows himself to us in his books, and these books, both poetry and prose, are exceptionally autobiographical, and what he really was. Over it all hangs his sense of himself as someone of instinct and emotion rather than of rational intelligence. Someone whose work was a kind of magic, inexplicable, because it came from some mysterious, unidentifiable source. In the last decade of his life, Sassoon found in his conversion to Roman Catholicism a mysticism that echoed this. He didn't want his religion, his new religion, to be explained in terms of dogma or of reason. Instead, he put much more emphasis to the occasional despair of those who assisted at his conversion on the cherubs and quivering crosses that he saw as strange visions while praying by himself late at night or early in the morning. Intellect and intelligence and experiment were not what Sassoon admired in art or in life. This was one of the problems that he found in some of his contemporaries or those of the next generation, T.S. Eliot, James Joyce, Ezra Pound, then W.H. Auden and the political poets of the 1930s. E.M. Forster's novels, for instance, he felt were bloodless, with too much arch humor. Sassoon declared, I'm not sure that dear EMF wouldn't have done better work if he'd been less acutely intelligent. <laughs> C compare him with Fitz, and you'll see what I mean. Fitz was Edward Fitzgerald, the 19th century translator of Omar Khayyam, whose delightful letters give a friendly, charming picture of mid-Victorian English country life. Charm was what Siegfried Sassoon loved in writing. His own prose is some of the most charming prose of the 20th century. So this, I think, became another of Sassoon's conflicts, a war with many of his literary contemporaries that contributed to his disenchantment with his own time. Because of it, he turned to nostalgia, to the past, not always to the true past, but to a place of mythical beauty and enchantment, what he called that <clears throat> illusory paradise where time has edited itself into tranquility and proportion. He liked this not only for the way it could smooth out many of the doubts and challenges of the present, but because he could make it beautiful. Sassoon was an aesthete, a man of the 1890s, who, as a friend said of him, loved beauty almost more than anything else. And he looked, especially during unsatisfactory moments, back to childhood innocence as the best 
the most beautiful years, even though the reality of his own childhood had been far from happy. Born in 1886, the son of a Jewish father and a Church of England English mother, Siegfried Sassoon was born to conflict, that of his parents' brief, unhappy marriage. He was born also to the conflict between his mother's determination to bring her sons up as little Englishmen and his father's different religious background. The conflict between her Puritan insularity and his father's cosmopolitan sophistication. The Sassoons were so rich that when Siegfried's father, Alfred, showed promise as a violinist as a young man, his mother gave him no less than two Stradivariuses. <laughs> then, when Alfred Sassoon announced that he wished to marry a Gentile, Teresa Thornycroft, Siegfried's mother, the deeply religious, orthodox, Jewish Mrs. Sassoon, Alfred's mother, cut Alfred out of her life. The Thornycrofts, sculptors and artists from farming stock, responded with typical Victorian materialism. They hot-footed it round to Somerset House to inspect the will, the Sassoon will. One of them reporting gleefully, I saw Sassoon's father's will, or rather an epitome of it this morning, and all seems right and the youth is free. He will be very well off. After their marriage, these two young people did an extraordinary thing. They bought what must be one of the ugliest houses in England. <laughs> the site of this monster called Weirley is in the Weald of Kent, and it was here that Siegfried grew up. The house, I don't want to be snobbish, but the house is a Victorian suburban Gothic dream of a medieval fairyland, <laughs> supposedly designed by a writer of children's books as a lodge house to a larger residence that was never built. During his childhood, especially when he began through fox hunting to move among the local gentry, Siegfried Sassoon felt ashamed of Weirley, dreaming of living in a mellow old mansion in an ancestral park. There was one compensation. Weirley had a large garden. Teresa Sassoon's delight and a long view across the Weald of Kent. All his life Siegfried dreamt of this landscape where he began at a very early age to write poetry. In this he was greatly encouraged by his mother who for his third birthday gave him a copy of Coleridge's lectures on Shakespeare. <laughs> Siegfried Sassoon's childhood was clouded by conflict. His father, Alfred, left Teresa for the American novelist Constance Fletcher when Siegfried was only five years old. Constance Fletcher wrote epigrammatic, brittle stories, had lived in Venice and known Oscar Wilde and Henry James. Alfred's preference for Constance Fletcher shows how country life with Teresa hadn't suited him. Alfred knew continental Europe particularly Paris, where he pursued the actress Sarah Bernhardt. Teresa painted romantic pictures, influenced by her friend G.M. Watts's style of painted poetry, as it's been called, yearning, slightly melancholy in atmosphere, often, especially when children are included, a little too heavy and sweet. She, she believed, Teresa believed, that there was something tarnishing about the big city, something dark, even artificial, even evil, much preferring what she saw as the natural simplicities of country life. She distrusted sophistication and artistic experiment, thinking later that even quite tame followers of modernism were dangerous, possibly mad, consumed with conceit to go against tradition and established form. She was the most tremendous Tory. <laughs> when Alfred left, it was torture for his wife, who as an abandoned woman felt humiliated in the strict male-orientated late Victorian world. With her three sons, she behaved nobly, never criticizing their father, although showing a silent agony during his visits to Weirley. <laughs> 
Soon Constance Fletcher left Alfred, reputedly in disappointment at discovering that he was only quite rich. Then when Siegfried was only nine, his father died of tuberculosis. Teresa wouldn't let the young Siegfried go to Alfred's funeral, thinking him too sensitive. His brothers brought back stories of an unfamiliar exotic ceremony in the Jewish cemetery in the Mile End Road. Teresa took a subtle revenge on her husband. She brought her three sons up to be little English boys in the Anglican faith, completely apart from their Jewish roots. In the autobiographical novel that he wrote, The Memoirs of a Fox Hunting Man, Sassoon's narrator, George Shurston, based on himself, is English to the bone, Anglican, with no hint of Jewishness. Siegfried saw himself as a Thornycroft, much more than a Sassoon. Others went along with this, T. E. Lawrence describing him once as the ideal Englishman. Paradoxically, it wasn't until the last decade of his life after his conversion to Roman Catholicism, that Siegfried Sassoon seemed interested in his Jewish roots and began to think about what these had contributed to his life and to his work. The reason I've dwelt on this early life is to show that for Sassoon, conflict began a long time before August 1914. It began with war at home, his unresolved personal life, his confusion about how to face his homosexuality, his conflicting wishes both to escape from the confines of his Kent upbringing and to please his mother, whose favorite son he knew he was. Above all this came the ambition to be a great poet. By 1914, he was well aware that this hadn't been fulfilled in his work. Much of the pre First War poetry is in what Sassoon called his lutes and nightingale style, lush, over romantic, dreamy stuff, coming to life only in parody and humour. Even early on, there's a vein of nostalgia, of a longing for some golden past, a lost world, surviving in memories that can seem more real and more satisfactory than the present. It's what came next that interested the American audiences in 1920, his transformation by the war. In August 1914, Siegfried Sassoon joined up immediately. He was wounded twice in 1917 and 1918. He won the Military Cross for rescuing a wounded soldier and, influenced by Bertrand Russell and other pacifists, he refused in June 1917 to return to his regiment declaring in a public statement that the war had become one of aggression and conflict rather than of defense and liberation. The army denied him the martyrdom of a court-martial. Instead, it shunted him off after a public diagnosis of shell shock to Craig Lockhart, what he called Dottyville, a huge, hideous sanatorium on the outskirts of Edinburgh then used as a treatment center for those suffering from neurasthenia. At Craig Lockhart, Sassoon met the younger poet, Wilfred Owen, a fellow patient, and was treated by Dr. Rivers, who persuaded him to return to the army, for which Sassoon was forever grateful. He may have hated war, but to go back proved that he hadn't collapsed, that he could take it, that he was a man. Sassoon was often doubtful of his masculinity. So in November 1917, he went with his regiment to Ireland, then in February 1918 to Egypt and Palestine. In April, he returned to France and was wounded in July and sent back to hospital in England. He spent the rest of the war away from the front. On Armistice Day, November the 11th, 1918, Siegfried Sassoon heard the church bells ring for victory thinking the celebrations a loathsome end to a loathsome four years. Loathsome they may have been, but they made him as a writer. This was another source of conflict, for while liking to have his work acclaimed, he disliked the connection with the First World War, which he never seemed to be able to shake off. Yet, he couldn't stop writing about it. Sassoon's war, 
or his part in it, must be one of the most fully documented in history. His wartime personality, the brave, sensitive, the rebellious young officer, has inspired not only most of the best of his poetry and prose, but other novels, plays, films, and above all, a general view of the war. The people involved are unforgettable. The young innocents whose deaths changed Sassoon into an angry, satirical poet. Dr. Rivers, the guzzling staff officers, the inept generals of the sharper poems, Wilfred Owen, Robert Graves. And at the story's centre is Siegfried Sassoon himself, who in his transformation from patriotic enthusiasm and even joy at the prospect of battle to bitterness and anger reflects the changes in how the First War came to be viewed after 1918. This was why Sassoon was in New York on a cold January day in 1920, still almost two years after the war had ended, trying to find a peacetime poetic voice. Part of the reason he'd crossed the Atlantic was the hope that the change might stimulate his writing. Since the war's end, he'd written some satirical verses and a few love poems inspired by the dissolute artist Gabriel Atkin. But it was still anger at the war that brought his poetry to life. Keen to break with a distracting social life brought about by his fame, Sassoon became a socialist, speaking for Labour candidates and observing strikes in Glasgow. I've offered myself to the people, and they've accepted me, he wrote. Will I live to be worthy of the trust? The answer, alas, seemed clear. The Labour candidate for whom he spoke went down to heavy defeat. In Glasgow, a Labour Party supporter shouted that Mr. Sassoon would never understand them, for he hadn't taken in Karl Marx with his mother's milk. He heard another revolutionary say of him, I've heard he spends a hundred a year on scent. <laughs> America might change his sense of drift and dislocation. Atkin, whom he'd hoped to change, was drinking more than ever. Dr. Rivers, his old doctor at Craig Lockhart, and still a trusted confidant, urged him to go. The truth was that the war haunted him for years, really for all his life. The young British men from the middle and upper classes who fought as officers in the trenches came less prepared for the horrors than their continental counterparts. It was partly because of their upbringing. Taught the code of chivalry and sacrifice at their private schools like Sassoon's Marlborough, they were not only spared most material hardships, but ignorant of what a large-scale war was like. Britain hadn't been involved in European wars since the defeat of Napoleon in 1815, whereas Germany and France had fought each other in 1870. Germany and France had conscription, so their huge armies were at least grounded in the idea, if not the appropriate tactics of huge battles. So soon, arriving at the front in November 1915, had little preparation, apart from the need for courage out hunting. Before the Somme changed his innocence forever, he wrote poetry glorifying war and the chance to die for one's country. So in the United States in 1920, he was still suffering from this change, this loss of faith. He couldn't sleep when someone dropped a pile of plates at the Harvard Union he dived instinctively for cover. It reminded him of the Western Front. To his audiences, he seemed nervous or offensive in his pacifism. The writer John Chapman, whose son had been killed in France, saw war as ennobling and thought that it should have lasted three times as long. After one of Sassoon's New York readings at the Cosmopolitan Club, Chapman leapt on the platform to denounce the poet's anti-war sentiments. Chapman wrote to Sassoon the next day, only half apologizing, saying that peacemongers and adoring women were exploiting the poet. 
But a skeptical student at Harvard found the poet's style cramped, his shyness awkward, his voice monotonous, and objected to his sympathy for the Germans and conscientious objectors. This skeptic also asked a key question. Will Sassoon continue a good poet now that war is lacking? Not all American women were captivated. The poet Edna St. Vincent Millay said, I wonder if he would have cared so much if it were a thousand female virgins who'd been slaughtered. <laughs> what, what was Secret Sassoon saying in those introductory words before he read from his work? The poems, he said, had been written for his soldiers, whom he saw as frail martyrs, the true victims of the war. He'd wanted also to attack the system that had made him, that had led to his shock at what he'd seen in the trenches. Unless society gave up war, he thought, the Prussian system that taught militarism to the children in schools was the best preparation for adulthood. Yet he made no, no mention of some of the results of the Prussian way, the German atrocities in occupied Belgium, northern France, and eastern Europe, or Germany's transformation during the war into a military dictatorship. Nations, Sassoon thought, needed outlets for heroism, but not war in which courage and the fear of being thought a coward, of failing, had been exploited by jingo politicians and bloodthirsty journalists. War destroyed individual peace for the victor as well as for the vanquished. It had destroyed the calm that Sassoon sought, although he didn't say this, at the center of himself. Then he used the words that came more than 10 years later at the end of Shurston's Progress, one of his autobiographical novels. For only in the inmost silence of our hearts do we know the world for what it is and ourselves for what the world has made us. He felt thrilled and alarmed by the United States. The hostesses lionized him. He fell in love with a young actor called Glenn Hunter. He found a great friend in the playwright, Sam Berman, and took an apartment on West 44th Street that looked on a huge neon sign ad that advertised Wrigley's spearmint gum <laughs> with the slogan, don't argue, but stick it in your face. <laughs> <laughs> the fastidious Sassoon wished it had been telling people to read the poems of Thomas Hardy. In Chicago, he recognized the absurdity of saying that war didn't pay when Carl Sandburg, the poet, showed him the huge, thriving industrial city. The lectures showed his contradictions. He loathed the idea of public performance. He mumbled. He could be incomprehensible. But something extraordinary, a blend of earnestness, charm, and integrity could come across at Bryn Mawr, in New York, at Yale, at Harvard, in Chicago. I don't know how I pull these shows off, he told Berman after a Vassa performance. Tonight was a hell of a success, and I wore the mask of a white, waistcoated, moderately genial young man. Funny life. In Chicago, at the National Council of Jewish Women, a captivated member of the audience had hysterics at the back of the hall. <laughs> Sam Berman, he tried to explain at least a part of his private agony. And in Berman's reaction, I think, we see how mesmeric Sassoon could be. The trouble was that his poems took very little time to write, leaving hours for brooding over the private agony of his homosexuality. The strongly heterosexual Berman was shocked, but in March, Berman wrote in his diary of a wonderful, strange day. SS told me everything. Beyond the sunlit shallows of his mind, that there's a black form moved by turbulent currents. <laughs>
Their friendship mixed laughter and frankness. Sassoon read Berman a poem about the king and queen having to make love out of patriotic duty. Then another time, some of T.S. Eliot's poems. The fascination was absolute. Berman thinking, my mind riveted to S these few days. There was one passport to peace, a letter of introduction from the British bibliophile Sidney Cockrell to Belle da Costa Green, librarian at the Morgan Library. Here she sewed Siegfried Sassoon, the manuscript of Pope's essay on man, a lock of Keats's hair, and made him cry at the sight of Keats's last message to Fanny Braun. But the anxiety of what would come next for his writing plagued Sassoon, and he mocked his transitory success in a parody of one of his most famous poems. Good evening, good evening, the lecturer bowed when we heard him last Monday in Carnegie Hall. Now the charm of his smile has caught on with the crowd and he's promised to come here again in the fall. I'm afraid he's a red, whispered Dora to Daisy as he cursed the old men who in wartime were lazy. But the lilt of his eyebrow has sent both of them crazy. <laughs> he felt stronger for having known this new American landscape, where even birdsong was a little cruel, and the beautiful New York. With Sam Berman, he looked ahead, saying that for the next ten years he'd gather impressions and live freely before settling down to write some great work. His war poems consoled him, for as he said, when I'm dead, perhaps my poems will keep some young fellows from being tortured. Sassoon went back to England in August 1920 and wrote about his tour some 20 years later in Siegfried's Journey, the last of his published autobiographies. There's no mention of the unhappy love affair with Glenn Hunter, of how there were women almost in hysterical in pursuit of him, as there were in England, of torturing doubts about what he'd do when he got home. I suppose he wrote of the American tour later in his diary, it was one of the most interesting things I've ever done. An American critic, Edmund Wilson, was sharper. Edmund Wilson wrote of the book's bland, even complacent tone, of a smoothing out of turbulence into a long, easy ride home. But when Siegfried's journey was written towards the end of the Second World War, this was what its author wanted a peaceful, friendly alternative to a harsh present. This is writing not exactly as therapy, but to make a better world for the writer. Irrevocably damaged by the war, Sassoon had a brief surge of optimism at its end, but this soon died. Yet there was, in the decade after 1918, a hope that this might literally have been the war to end wars. In 1922, the Washington Conference led to agreement on arms control and disarmament. The Locarno Treaty of 1925 brought security to Western Europe's frontiers. In 1926, Germany joined the League of Nations. In 1928, the Kellogg-Briand Pact outlawed war as permissible policy. British defence plans after 1919 were dominated by the theory that Britain wouldn't take part in another major war for at least 10 years. Gradually, British perceptions of the war changed from the triumphalism of victory. Politicians and pundits began to write memoirs and criticisms of the war's high command. And toward the end of the 1920s, some of the writers began to have their say. Sassoon's first contribution, The Memoirs of a Fox Hunting Man, came out in 1928. It began as a fictional autobiography of a retired sporting colonel living in Cheltenham, partly designed as an antidote to its author's melancholy and sexual frustration. Then it became the story of his own development as a fox hunter, cricketer, and young officer at the front. In many ways, the book is a sanitized account, with nothing about several of the most important aspects of his life, like his Jewish ancestry, his homosexuality, 
and his poetry. A part of its power lies, I think, and I think it is a very powerful book, in the sense of innocence traduced, of youth and hope trapped in the mud and slaughter of the Western Front. The Fox Hunting Man and its successor, the memoirs of an infantry officer, published two years later, were all the more powerful because they coincided with two other brilliant war memoirs, Graves' Goodbye to All That and Edmund Blunden's Undertones of War, and the most complete edition yet of the poems of Wilfred Owen, which Blunden had been persuaded to edit by Siegfried Sassoon, came out in 1931. Henceforth, the dominant literary version of the war, relayed still in fiction today, became one of lions led by donkeys, or of brave innocence, of beauty tarnished, for many of the first war writers were heirs of the 1890s. This version established itself as the 30s, a much more terrifying decade began. Hope dissolved into economic crisis, unemployment, the failure of the League of Nations, rearmament, wars in the Far East and Abyssinia, and Hitler's coming to power. It's been said that poets like Sassoon, through their unforgettable description of the hell of war, contributed to the climate of appeasement in 1930s Britain. Certainly what some historians have seen as the nobler aspects of appeasement are in the spirit of the memoirs of a fox-hunting man, a sense of fair play towards the Germans, a wish to restrain the vengeful French, a determination to treat Hitler and the Nazi leaders as gentlemen. But as the second of Siegfried Sassoon's great wars approached, and to some seemed inevitable from 1933 onwards, how did he view the political and international landscapes? Sassoon was never a political animal. He wasn't even particularly interested in politics or politicians unless suddenly caught up in an emotional turmoil, as with the general strike in 1926 when he passionately supported the miners or the shock of his own experiences on the Western Front. The 1930s prompted similarly atavistic reactions against rearmament, against Churchill, whom Sassoon thought a warmonger, yet also shock at reports of Nazi treatment of the Jews. His poetry briefly took a political turn again. The collection The Road to Ruin, published in 1933, depicts a future of bombed cities, catastrophe, the triumph of the Prince of Darkness. At first he felt sure that to campaign for peace was the right response and that ordinary Germans must feel the same if only they could be reached over the heads of their leaders. But as the decade wore on, he began to see that there had to be confrontation, believing when war broke out in 1939 that it had become inevitable. The depressing international scene, scene seemed to be reflected in the conflict in Sassoon's own life. His poetry fell from critical favor, eclipsed by the modernist revolution of Pound and Eliot. His dream of a happy marriage and family life failed at Hatesbury, the country house near Salisbury that he'd bought after marrying Hester Gatty in 1933. At least he had one comfort that made the future interesting and the present worthwhile. A brilliant and loving son, George, Sassoon's only child, who'd been born in 1936. Resigned to another war, Sassoon took little interest in it, irritated when his wife or guests wanted to listen often to the news. But the war affected him inevitably, through evacuees being sent to Hatesbury, soldiers camping in his park, the difficulty of travel that increased his isolation. Although mixing little with the county gentry, Sassoon became a sort of literary squire, tending his trees, clearing scrub, riding round his property, delighting in the rustic charm of those who worked for him. A figure of affectionate 
amusement to the villagers, who called him the captain and tolerated his walking back to the house while he was supposed to be fielding during cricket matches. After all, he did own the pitch. <laughs> One of his few contributions to the war effort was to publish some uninspiring propaganda poems called Silent Service in the English spirit. Sassoon didn't put himself forward for any sort of war service, hoping secretly that he might be approached to do something. No approach came. A further sign, he thought, of his irrelevance. The success of his three volumes of straight autobiography that had begun with the publication of The Old Century in 1938 pleased rather than delighted him. What he'd always wanted to be was a great universal lyric poet, not a satirist or writer of prose or memoirs or someone linked irrevocably to the Western Front. This conflict with the modern age seemed doomed to end in defeat. Then in 1957, after dark years, Sassoon converted to Roman Catholicism, guided by a nun who had written to him to say that she'd seen a religious yearning in his poetry. At last, he found peace. His wars, however, are still here. They're still with us today. In Siegfried's Journey, the last volume of his autobiography published in 1945, he recanted his 1917 protest. He wrote that he now thought it had been necessary to fight on until the defeat of the enemy. But these paragraphs in a book that sold far less well than his earlier work lacked the resonance of the war poems or the Shurston memoirs. The man himself became a myth, inspiring not only novels and plays, but an idea of how the trenches had really been. Siegfried Sassoon's war has been explained many times, first by its advocates, then by the revisionists, and by the revisionists of the revisionists. As I've said, other literary memorials loom beside it. Owen's preface about the poetry being in the pity, Blunden's and Graves' memoirs, most of the war poets who feature in anthologies. It leaves a sense so strong in the 1930s that another war must be prevented at almost any cost, that this had been the worst ever war. For the British in the Second World War, the fighting in the Far Eastern jungles in Normandy in 1944, or in the Italian campaign, were ordeals at least as great as those in the trenches, although involving fewer troops. But there's none of the sense of innocence exploited, which still in Britain arouses anger over the Somme or Passchendaele. Sometimes it seems as if there's a national need for an epic almost masochistic view of exhausted soldiers coping with horror. The British equivalent of the Russians at Stalingrad, or the Americans fighting the Japanese in the Pacific, yet more helpless, more overwhelmed. Over the last 30 years, historians have pointed another way. The British army stuck it out, evolving from the small force that landed on mainland Europe in 1914 to enforce treaty obligations to neutral Belgium, that it became a main component of victory in 1918. Without mutiny, it recovered from terrible bloody battles to defeat its supposedly invincible opponents that the war had been necessary to stop the domination of Europe by a militaristic regime and its unstable, weak, supreme warlord, the Kaiser. Then a new novel or film comes out, read or watched by thousands, even millions, and it seems as if the historians might well have stayed silent. A friend's remark about Siegfried Sassoon being predominantly a first war man is surely right. Those four years shaped him and his writing forever. Not surprising when he entered the army as a fastidious young idealist, anxious to conform to a background that repressed what made him different, his Jewishness and his homosexuality. 
but Sassoon's war experiences were restricted to inauspicious times. He completely missed the triumphant last battles of 1918 when Wilfred Owen wrote from the front line that there was no place he would rather be. Out of this and the years that followed, I think Sassoon created something different from historical truth. He transformed his own inner turbulence into anger, satire, and beauty, into a nostalgic search for a utopia that at the end he found in faith. In a sense, he rises above facts or reality. Sassoon evokes, I think, a lost, decent England, achieved only in the imagination, perhaps only in the imagination of an outsider. In his version of the First World War, he created, I think, a myth that is perhaps better and more honourable than most myths by which nations live. Certainly, the writings of Siegfried Sassoon have helped it to endure. Thank you. to answer any questions if anybody's got any. <laughs> Sir, please. Yes. Well, I think, sir, I, 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 think, I, I think there's no doubt. I, I uh, question the word mentor. Yes. Well, I think he was his mentor. There's no doubt about that. But I think that Owen would have probably burst through anyway. I, I, I think one has to say, I mean, this is just a personal judgment, but of all the poets of the First War, all the British poets of the First War, I, I would say that Owen was the greatest. I don't think that there could be I mean, either Owen or perhaps Isaac Rosenberg. It's very difficult to between the to choose between the two. But I personally, my feeling is that Owen was the greatest British poet to emerge out of the First War. And if he'd lived, who knows what would have happened. He might have not gone on to write something greater than the poems he wrote during the First War, or he might have developed. This, the extraordinary thing, I mean, if I may say so, so that if you were to read my book, you would discover this. The great thing is that Suin, Sassoon had this extraordinary idea of Owen that he cultivated after Owen's death. Sassoon, Sassoon didn't like uh, what one might describe as the revolution that took place in modernism. He didn't like Eliot, he didn't admire Eliot's poems, he didn't admire Pound's poems. And he had this vision that if Owen had lived, that he and Owen somehow together would have been able to mount a counterattack against modernism and would have taken poetry in a completely different direction, and they would have followed the line of Thomas Hardy. They would have taken that line, that English poetry would have followed Hardy's path as opposed to the Eliot and the Pound path. I personally, I mean, who knows what would have happened if Owen had lived. I personally think that Owen was a very pliable, uh, uh, he was very, very interested in what was ha happening in literary life, new developments in verse, and I think he would have been very, very, very interested in um, 
the modernist revolution and would have been deeply affected by it. I don't think he would have rejected it completely in the way that Sassoon did. So I think this was a bit of a comfort. Sassoon seized on this as a comfort. He used to say, oh, if only Wilfred had lived, we could have got the better of these people. We could have, written, we could have taken English poetry in an entirely different direction. To me, that's not uh, true. Uh, I don't think that is true. But I think but the interesting thing is that the British soldiers who go to Iraq now, uh, they read um, poetry, sometimes not a great deal, but they do a bit. But the poet who appeals to them the most because he conjures up war, I think, in a very dramatic, almost journalistic way, is Sassoon, whereas Owen's poetry, I think, has a perhaps a more y universal quality. It doesn't only apply to war, it applies to, to life in general. Sassoon's poems, if you read them, you can almost feel the sense of the trenches, the atmosphere, almost hear the, the shells exploding. And so I think Sassoon's appeal lasts in a, in, in a way that uh, perhaps he didn't give himself enough credit for. So. I think a comment or something I said in other years ago, perhaps when Sassoon died, he said he was the last of a long line of English past boys. Would you agree with that? Yes, you're quite right. He was, he loved the English country. Uh, I mean, he, he was um, very much conscious that he was writing at a time when um, the English countryside was not being destroyed. I mean, England is still, although I say to myself, a very beautiful country, but um, the towns were encroaching on the rural landscape in a way that was very obvious to everybody. And this was a part of his attempt to create a utopia. He created this um, a pastoral scene, and you can see this when you read his poems. And I think there are English poets who are writing today who do write about uh, uh, country matters, but um, uh, so I don't think it's entirely true that he's the very last one. I mean, Seamus Heaney, I suppose, is an Irish poet, but he writes constantly about uh, country scenes and uh, country, um, uh, the country, the landscape of the country. So I don't think it's it's gone completely. But towards the end of his life, yes, he he did he. I mean, after say about 1930, his poetry is almost all, all about uh, uh, um, rural matters. One would say. <laughs> so. so. <laughs> <Oops>. <laughs> Yes, they did. Now, this is not really very well known. No, there are French and, French and German poets. I mean, Apollinaire, the great French poets, he wrote very good and interesting poems about the First War. The great German writer, I think, about the First War is a prose writer called Ernst Junger. I don't know if you've ever read, read any of his work. Brilliant evocations of... Uh, the machine age battle, Storm of Steel, a wonder, I mean, a fascinating, slightly sinister book, but, a, but a, I mean, a very, very stirring and extraordinary work. Um, so uh, there were French and German writers who wrote with great strength about the First War. But the, the, I think what is quite interesting about the British writers is that they combine this, they they are able to recreate the, the hell of the trenches, but they combine it with this sense of nostalgia for a lost world, for a rural landscape. The French and the Germans don't do that at all. Um, they never had that feeling for um, the rural landscape. I think partly because France particularly was a much more uh, um, rural country and, and uh, therefore there wasn't a sense of a lost paradise that there was in England. The Industrial Revolution came far later to France and in 1914 much of France was still a rural country and, and uh, many more Frenchmen lived in the countryside and followed country pursuits, worked in farming and agriculture than English people did. Uh, and so there wasn't the romantic... Um, view of the country that English people had. So, 
Oh, yes, well, that I can tell you a lot about, because I got to know the son very well, George, who was a wonderful man who, alas, died a very short time ago, three or four months ago. And George was Siegfried's only son and um, suffered from this and suffered from the, the failure of Siegfried's marriage, which went wrong quite quickly. And uh, there was a terrible, what one might call, tug of love. Um, both parents behaved badly, I think. Uh, they, they tried to keep George for themselves. They offered him inducements to stay with them. And so George had a very confused upbringing. Um, and on top of this came the problem of being the child of a famous man, which is always difficult anyway. And uh, I think George did very well, really. He, I mean, he, 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 he had a weakness for women, unlike his father. <laughs> He was, he, he was married four times, <laughs> which is, I think, too many. Don't you? <laughs> they, were all they were all interesting in their different ways. The last wife was a wonderful person who was a great, great um, friend of mine. But he was dogged by terrible tragedy. He had two children killed in a car crash. He lost a lot of money as a member of Lloyd's. He was a very, very clever man, a very clever scientist. He won a scholarship to Cambridge. He worked in science all his life. He was a brilliant linguist. He made uh, quite a good living from translating scientific papers from German into English and then from English into German. He spoke fluent Serbo-Croat. He claimed to be able to pick up a new language by going to a country and spending two weeks in the bars of that country. <laughs> he was a wonderful man. I miss him very, very much. And he overcame this business of being Siegfried's son, which was a, a, a very great um, burden for him. Are there any grandchildren? Yes, George had one, one surviving daughter, Kendall. Who, who, who is a talented person. Um, she, she's a female comedienne. She goes around um, clubs in the Midlands in England and doing these different acts. And she, she's a considerable figure. She's not entirely what George would have wanted, but she's a very... <laughs> <laughs> But she's marvellous, really. She, I mean, if she were here tonight, you'd be very amused by her. <laughs> Any other questions? Sir? We were in China several years ago, Shanghai, and we were in hotels that apparently had been developed by the Sassoon family. Yes. Do you know which part of the family? Yes, indeed. The, the, the Sassoon made an enormous amount of money. They were... They originally, uh, uh, they began their, their life as, uh, they began their successful commercial life as traders in Iraq. And then the Ottoman Empire made things difficult for them. And so in the middle of the 19th century, they moved to Bombay. And they flourished and were very successful in Bombay. And then various cousins and sons were sent to different parts of the world. Some were sent to Hong Kong and Shanghai. Some were sent to England, to London. And they built up this vast trading network and were very, very successful. And um, certainly China and certainly Hong Kong came within that orbit. And there are Sassoons today who are, have still got quite a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> any, any other questions? No? Well, thank you all very much. <laughs>